title. And this is a short title. So the term pastonization was suggested to me by Nikita Nikrasov, and I got official permission from Vasily to use this term. Anyhow, uh, so I will talk about two papers which is not yet out, and I hope they will be out this year, but I don't know. Uh, we keep, I mean, hoping. Uh, so this is work done together with Guido Fistuccio, Jan Kri, who are in Uppsala, Jacob Winden, my former PhD student who is a postdoc in Korea now, and myself. Um, so first of all, let me explain uh, and uh, what's going on and what's the problem I'm going to address. So I actually would like to look at N equal to supersymmetric young mill theories on curved background. And I would like to basically ask, uh, you know, two questions. Of course, first question is sort of existence. And second question is, I mean, when they can be localized. And by localized, I mean writing the closed answer, uh, not, I mean, doing anything else. Um, so let me just review what the situation historically has been. So what do we know about supersymmetric theories on curved background? So, of course, first thing what we know is uh, goes back to 80s. And this is typically goes under the name of Donaldson Eaton theory. And this is basically, we call it twisted uh, n equal to Young Mills. Uh, so this theory is basically concentrated. So you can put on any curved manifold. You know, there is certain identification of Lorentz group with um, uh, SU2R symmetry. And uh, you can put on any manifold. And basically, it's related to uh, this equation, and to instant on equation, et cetera. And then theory is supposed to calculate in some way volume of, uh, or, you know, intersection numbers of modular space of instantons. So although this theory has been formulated for a long time, it's extremely hard. So basically no calculations. I mean, concrete, so I mean, you can put theory everywhere, but if I give you manifold arbitrary and ask you to calculate something in a closed form, I mean, it would be in, in very, very hard. So then um, around 90s, around 95, Basically, this paper is 97, 98, by a bunch of Russians, Losev, Ikrasov, of Shatashvili, was suggested the program when you try to understand the theory in a current way. So in particular, of course, they were interested when you look at R4, and then you put certain equivalence here, so you rotate your space, and then you look at equivalent uh, donaldson witten theory. So this would, of course, require that your manifold has a symmetry, so, but their main concern was for actually this space, et cetera, and eventually hold this program, I mean, around, I think, 2002 by Nikrasov, has been calculated, so we have Nikrasov partition function, which is basically just a sum QN and uh, of a modular space of instantons. You have to calculate volumes, and you are doing this in equivalent uh, way. So the whole idea is that you have to use full equivalence. Uh, so you have a torus, which is basically rank of the group plus two, and um, then there are certain subtleties, but they actually only fixed points, certain points uh, contribute from this modular space. And these actually points can be a posteriori interpreted as a point like instantons, reducible U1 instanton sitting at origin. Okay? So this is Nikrasov partition function, and it depends on the value of scalar at infinity. It depends on Q, which is instant on number, and of course it depends on this equivalent parameters. So basically this is also, you can think as equivalent parameters, okay? So by the way, right away in two years, there is a paper in 2004 again by Nikrasov. 
which is basically he was suggesting. It's not actually derivation, but it's a reasonable suggestion. He said that if you would now look, try to look at some toric manifold, toric for D manifold, and you try to put their uh, equivalent Donaldson Witten theory, Donaldson Witten theory, uh, then the idea is the following that for this manifold, actually, you have to glue his flat partition functions for R4. And then, you know, you write, uh, you know, one contribution, epsilon, epsilon, A, Q, another contribution, et cetera, another contribution. So basically, you have to put contribution for every fixed point. And also, there are some will be shifts in here and some sum related to H2, second cohomology, so what he called fluxes. So it's very reasonable conjecture, but you know, in fact, this type of formula was suggested by Nikrasov in 2004. Hmm? Epsilon one, uh, A, sorry, A, Q. So general formula actually what he suggested, it's in fact in proceedings. But part of the thing is that what uh, Nikrasov is writing, you cannot find anywhere. <laughs> So it's one of the proceedings. I don't know if it's on archive. So here, it's basically for every fixed points, you can have to put Nikras partition functions, and also you have to put certain shifts and have a sum of H2, because if you have non-trivial H2, et cetera. Okay? So this was suggested. There are no integrals. It's not was derived in any way. It was more or less suggested. It looks reasonable. And of course, you have to discuss if it's compact, non-compact, et cetera. Then, of course, in 2007, it was Peston. And uh, he was able to take an equal to theory and uh, put it on S4. And then, um, uh, basically, his answer on S4 was uh, written as follows. So it was written as an integral dA. Uh, over Rn, and then you would have a right a Nikrasov partition function of I A Q. In principle, I mean, these parameters you can read just as from the data from neighborhood of the, your point, and in principle, you can squash it. So you can consider not necessary round sphere. And then times some polynomial of A, which is correspond to classical pews. There is no need to write perturbative thing because it's also decomposed. So Nikras partition function also has a perturbative part, and it's also factorizable. So now in Peston's story, the problem was the following, that he, this is actually instant on contribution. On. And this is anti-instanton. Okay. Um, so in principle, you have point like instanton. So let me first of all stress out that uh, if you honestly, if you compare this result with Nikrasov result, this is a derivation. This is a conjecture. Okay, so Peston conjectures this result. It's not derived. For example, here there is different approaches. You can regularize, you can introduce non-commutativity, et cetera. Here it's not. I mean, we are not actually, I mean, controlling configurations. They become quite singular. This is a general feature of four and higher dimensions that we conjecture results because our configurations are singular and we actually don't want to analyze PDEs, et cetera. It looks very complicated. But it's a very reasonable conjecture from many points of view. Okay? And then basically after this result, so that people, uh, you know, wrote supersymmetric theory on the square sphere, et cetera. But actually, uh, it was no any full classification of n equal two theories on curved manifold. There were different attempts, and also I'm at least personally unaware 
of any results on other manifolds. So there are, for example, uh, from CISA group, there are results for equivalent Donaldson-Witten on CP2, S2 times S2, but not a uh, generalization of Pestun when you try to take an equal to theory. Now, when you look at this thing, so when you look at the Nikrasov conjecture result, when you look at Pestun result, there is a following crazy idea which will pop up in your mind, right? So basically, what think is the following would make sense. So imagine I have a, any a manifold, so I have a manifold, M. And then I would have some, a vector field to some action of the group. For example, it's very natural to assume that I have action of T2. Okay? And then I would assume that I have only isolated fixed points. One loop determinant you can also factorize and put in there, yeah. Just to save time in writing. Uh, so then I have my manifold. So imagine I have my manifold and I have only isolated fixed points. Right, then what would, I mean, when you look at these two things, what you would think is the following. Let me randomly distribute instantons and anti-instantons. So, I put plus, plus, minus, minus, for example, okay? And then it would make sense that I would start to write for you now a Nikrasov partition function. So for Q, so this is, uh, this is contribution one, two, three, four. So this is for one. Equivalent parameters epsilon, I can just read from the toric data. It's a local data. Then uh, two, again, instant on, then uh, three anti-instanton, and then four anti-instanton, and of course, I have to integrate over parameter A, etc. Sorry? No, no. No, I mean, at that time, in 2004, nobody even thought about it. So his problem was actually try to think. So this is what's speculative. So he knew what's going on R4. He said, let me take a Tory guy and imagine. And he said that if on R4 all contribution comes from point-like instant on, then it would be natural to assume that everything comes from point-like instant on sitting at fixed points. And then the only difference was that if you have H2, there will be some fluxes. And he, again, gave a conjectural answer. So at that time was not even thought. So I mean, till before Peston came with this thing, I mean, he even didn't pose the question. Okay, so you can try to think of this answer. Maybe there is some classical term, etc. Right, I mean, it looks natural. And the answer is, that this is in fact the answer. So let me first give you, tell you the answer and then try to explain why it makes sense and also basically elaborate different points. So the answer. So if you give me a vector field, so if you give me uh, basically um, um, any manifold with T2 action, Again, if you mathematically pedantic, it doesn't have to be toric because toric typically assumes symplectic is just some good T2 action with only, with only isolated fixed points. Fixed points. Then uh, what you do, you distribute, distribute plus and minuses arbitrarily. Then uh, the statement is the following, that there is exists a supersymmetry, there is exists killing spinners. I mean, there are some subtleties I don't want to discuss. So basically, if I want to talk about normal killing spinners, I have to assume that my M, uh, my M is spin. Uh, but this is, can be actually relaxed because any four manifold B will be spin C. But also works, also works or spin C, but I don't want to discuss it. 
Okay, uh, so then there is exist the killing spinners, uh, satisfying, well, satisfying killing spinner equation. So there is exist a supersymmetric Young Mills on this M. Okay. And um, basically you can, there is some uh, technical subtleties, but in principle uh, you can write the answer and the answer morally is exactly this. Also here you have to assume that you may have a sum over fluxes. If uh, there is H2, I mean you cannot exclude them, etc. So this is the answer. And we actually constructed, and the thing is that uh, in a way we constructed, it's uh, maybe unusual in the area, but maybe it's a very good approach. Uh, so visual thinking, we always criticize that visual thinking is bad, but sometimes it's very good. Because actually we assume the answer and we derived things. So for example, when you write a solution for killing spinners, when you fixed all supergroup gravity backgrounds, et cetera, they look crazy. I mean, certain f expressions, looks in general, they go for three, four lines, but they exist. I mean, so it's an honest thing. So in it, now, if you will try to do address problem in this, uh, you know, Festuccia Cyborg philosophy from beginning, I mean, you will be killed right away. So it's better to guess the answer and then fiddle everything inside. Plus, so for plus, I will put instant on, so it's instant on. And for minus, it's anti instant on. No. They can be arbitrary. No. I don't sum it, no. Yes, each configuration. So for different distributions of, uh, on the manifold, for different distributions, plus and minuses, I have different supersymmetry. Uh, well, uh, I can tell you, there is purely very simple mathematical theorem. Uh, so if you give me a four manifold compact uh, with um, killing vector, so actually in construction I just need a, a killing vector. So then the killing vector typically you would prove that either it's a S1, and this typically will be factorized, or it's just part of T2 or T3. So there is no other possibility. There are mathematical theorems. So in a way T2 is the most interesting case. But actually what you need, you just need a vector field which is killing. But once it's killing, there is theorems for compact manifold that it basically comes from the group action. And typically it's some, some torus. And cases like you know, S1 or T3, it's ever degenerate. T2 is the most interesting. Of course in this, no. T2, S4 has a, I mean T2 action, right? With two fixed points. Yeah? So just write this as a question in uh, R5, right? I mean, zeta one squared plus zeta two squared plus x5 equal to one, and then you rotate the zeta, then this is exactly your T2 action. Any other questions? So let me try to explain um, sort of physical and mathematical meaning of this, et cetera, and Basically, also what is interesting, it's a technology we are doing, and in a way, and also what I will try to tell you in a way that what Peston did, and what Donaldson Witten or Nikrasov did, it's not that far away. It may look that it's very far away, but it's a variation of the same theme. Uh, so there are two uh, different concepts, etc. Um, here, so let me try to think. So. Let me first give you an idea. Why do we like donaldson witten theory? It's basically because at least formally we can define and calculate. So the whole thing is the following, that we have F plus uh, zero, and this is elliptic equation, meaning the following. If I would add a gauge fixing, so I'm looking at linearized, so I mean, uh, I can do it properly mathematically, but I'm just oversimplifying things. So if I write these equations and I write as a matrix, you know, as with momentum, then this matrix away from zero is invertible. So this is what means elliptic. 
So in compact manifolds, ellipticity and being Fredholm operator, it's the same thing. So basically, the kernel is very small. So it guarantees me more or less that dimension of my space is very small. So this is modular space, then I can basically at least effectively reduce my theory to something finite dimensional. So this is elliptic. So another thing is what you can do is, uh, what we learn in localization problems nowadays that not only elliptic problems are good, but also transverse elliptic problems are good. So transverse ellipticity is a very simple concept. If you have a group action, so if you have a group action, okay, then what you would require from your question is that you have a elliptic things in a direction transverse uh, to group action. Okay, so this is transverse ellipticity. It sounds very funny, so of course it's very hard to read at here lectures, but it's not that hard problem. So the simplest example is the following. So imagine you take S1 times C, right? And then you take a Dalbo operator here. So you have coordinates T, zeta, zeta bar. Okay, so uh, typically when you would have C, you write a, a Dalbo operator, it's elliptic operator. Okay, and uh, for example, if you compactify the space, then there is very little, I mean, very finite dimensional space of solutions in which annihilate this operator, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, now, if I put on a bigger space, so this is my action of the group, this is S1. So in fact, uh, this operator is transverse elliptic, it means that it's elliptic in direction transverse to S1. So basically, I have to look, and this is a local concept. I mean, it's not a global thing. So you just look right in local coordinates, and this is uh, transverse. Now, what is important, why do we like it? Because actually, if I write some, any good operators here on this whole space, for example, if I would write a Laplacian, then this is obviously will be dt squared plus d d bar. So typically, this is a way of checking transverse ellipticity. So if I take my operator, for example, d, I write some d dagger, then I write lead derivative square, it gives me typically second order of elliptic operator. If this is the case, this is transversely elliptic. So what is good about this operator, it would not have a finite dimensional kernels, but it has a kernels, if I start to basically expand in the modes of this guy, it has a finite dimensional kernels with this fixed, I mean, uh, value of, I mean, of my, well, not winding, but if I start to expand in Fourier modes. So this is basically what I'm doing. Instead of analyzing determinant of this, we actually can reduce things, I mean, to there. That's a whole notion. And again, calculationally, it's very good because what is important is that we still can control situation. So the thing is that, in principle, we are, in old days, we are very much fixated on finite dimensional model of spaces because we like integrals over finite dimensional space. But what I'm saying is that if you, Basically, a uh, modular space is infinite dimensional, but there is a very clear sublocus with respect to gauge, I mean, to whatever your equivalence, which is finite dimensional, you still can calculate things and basically put this some uh, generating function, etc. So, for example, let me give you a very simple example. So, in 4D, this is my elliptic problem. So, I can ask uh, that I would like to uh, construct transversely elliptic problem from there. For example, I will go to 5D. And again, my discussion is local. So let me add a coordinate T. So then I will have differential DT, and then I will have a vector field DT, okay? So just local, so take, think about manifold M and I just add a direction. I mean, I don't care, it can be line. So then, of course, what is, would be natural is that I would write FH plus so horizontal, so I'm just now doing uh, self-duality only in horizontal direction, so I don't have anything there. So this is this. So this is three conditions. Then, of course, I have still to put a gauge fixing. This is one condition. So now, in fact, uh, you know, things are actually missing uh, up, so I have to add one condition. Of course, what would be very natural is to add this condition, so that somehow Effectively, nothing depends on this, but this is too many conditions. This is four conditions. So you can actually put this guy there. So, and that becomes one condition. So if you write a symbol of this operator, and uh, 
So just write this problem and write the symbol of this operator. And for example, uh, you would reduce it to 4D. So write in 4D. It's exactly the matrices which Peston wrote in his paper. Okay. So in a way, the story is the following. So this is transversely elliptic problem. So I just moved it up. So I try to mimic. So I, I have a horizontal space. Everything is elliptic. And then along certain directions, something is not. So in 5D, in principle, this story can be covertized. But I'm not interested very much in this. But for example, what actually, if you want to understand what Peston is doing in the following. So you have this model. You wrote this model. But let me now reduce this down in slightly different way. So let me reduce down, not along T, but T plus some other direction, for example. T plus, I don't know, call it theta, et cetera. So I had some symmetries here. I put a T. I tilted my symmetry, and I put it back. So basically, then, naturally, in 4D, you will get a transversely elliptic problem. And your instantons may flip-flop, because it depends if these two directions will be oriented in the same way at fixed points, or if they will be anti-oriented. So that's basically uh, mathematics of uh, what's going on. So if you wish, you take a donaldson witten theory, you push it to the 5D, you just write this, thinks that it's a nice problem mathematically, and then you pull it down, but you sort of reduce it uh, this a bit up. So for example, this is originally was our motivation. So we did this. So if you take a YPQ space, so this is a 5D Sasaki-Einstein manifold. OK, and um, so this is topologically as 3 times S2. So supersymmetry, for example, if you look at killing spinners, et cetera, then if you write the equation there, so supersymmetry will tell you which is good equation. So for example, I mean, the equation which you write this, this is typically called contact form. It's fixed everything by supersymmetry. I don't want to go to discussion there. And uh, generically, this, my rib vector field, so which the guy, so this is totally equivalent. So this is way of writing is equivalent to saying that I will have FH horizontal equal to 0 and IRF equal to 0. So this is not quite that problem, but you know, I'm just. And then uh, what I'm trying to say, so my vector field goes around. But at the same time, this happens to be, again, one has to analyze, but this has happened to be a vibration, U1 vibration of S2 times S2. This U1 does not coincide with this guy. So the toric diagram is like this. Now you have to take this equation, which is fixed in 5D, and push it down. But you will reduce not along this symmetry or along these guys. So basically, you have to contract with another vector field, which is corresponds to the free action. And this sign can jump. It depends from geometry. You just have to calculate it. So if you calculate these examples, you will get plus, plus, minus, minus. So that was our original motivation. So in, in end of 2016, we actually realized. So this example is very cute. For example, here, killing spinners would I mean, not depend, so you can reduce killing spinners, you can reduce young mills, you can do a lot of stuff here. Again, this is, of course, 5D is not general situation, so I cannot actually take any 5D, 4D manifold with this setting and lift it up, okay? But this is basically the idea why an instant don't start to jump, et cetera. If you push problem in 5D, it's nothing, it's jumping. It's because you reduce things, it's, uh, you know, plus and minus. So the question is, how do you write the system and what you're actually doing mathematically? So in a way, I have to push problem 5D and then reduce slightly different directions. So let me give you a rough idea, and then I will maybe have time to comment on killing spinners, et cetera. Because, of course, what, uh, you, what looks strange is the following. For example, if you know how donaldson witten theory is defined as a field theory, I mean, you need self-dual self -dual forms, right? 
you are told from you know, kindergarten that you have self-dual forms. You cannot have a form which is self-dual here, anti-self-dual here, etc. Uh, but in fact, it's wrong. So let me tell you why it's wrong. And uh, again, we derive these formulas. I mean, this is whole project is a visual thinking. You don't know what to get, and then you derive very cute formulas. Well, it's not always the case. So let me assume that I have M, and I have a vector field, a globally defined vector field. So I'm on 4D manifold. And then I will introduce K uh, or kappa, which is GV. Okay. Then there is, um, so let me first look, and again, my for now discussion locally. So let's look when, uh, when V is not zero. So as you look at locally on some manifold or whatever. There is a very curious map. So if I take M and I, its maps form to form to minus B plus two length of V kappa H I V, V, you can check very easily that this map actually sends cell dual forms to anti cell dual forms and vice versa. In fact, M squares to one. So if you want to understand what this M is, it's not, I mean, again, I'm staying for now away from zero, so V. So in fact, V is not such an exotic thing because when I have a vector field and I have a metric, I can always decompose my form in vertical and horizontal pieces, right? So in principle, there are, on general manifold, there are two decompositions of two forms, on self-dual and anti-self-dual. But if I would have a vector field, and this vector field is no way zero, I can always decompose my space in vertical forms and horizontal forms. So if you write these things, my projector basically will be one over two, one plus minus M. So this will give me a decomposition of two forms to horizontal and vertical. And this again will have three components, three components. Again, it's true only when V doesn't have a zero, otherwise it's not well defined. Okay, so now this decomposition is orthogonal. Then basically this M, what I'm saying here is that M is anti-commuting with a star. So this is the relations I have. So vector field, the existence of globally defined vector field gives you much more So what you can do, so let me give you a definition in two ways. So first, more mathematical, another more practical. And the um, so mathematical way is the following. So imagine I, I have my manifold, and I have my vector field uh, V, and I have isolated points, sorry, isolated fixed points. So then I decide to choose the cover such that I have a patch around every point. Then I distribute, as I told you, pluses and minuses, which means that if I have a plus here, then I put locally, so this is, let's say, I, then I put a self-dual forms of this patch. Of this patch, I put anti-self-dual forms. For example, if I put minus j, so this is your j. So on this intersection, I'm just using this map. So I would say that mij is just will map uh, two forms on i to minus forms on j. If, for example, I connect my forms on uh, the same, so this is plus, this is plus, I can use identity map. 
So it's a trivial thing that one can check uh, that this map satisfy all conditions you need to define a bundle. It satisfy co-cycle condition, etc. So actually, if you have a globally defined vector field, you patch your things around, you can glue the bundle, and it will be rank three bundle, uh, which is, um, will give you. So there is a three, I mean, rank three sub bundle, which at every patch can be basically rotated to self-dual or anti-self-dual forms. You cannot do it globally. So again, what is important that this sub bundle is not, I mean, self-dual, anti-self-dual form, but what I'm saying is that if I look over patch, there is just orthogonal rotation respecting things which will bring it to self-dual. If I restrict to this patch, there is orthogonal rotation which brings to anti-self-dual, okay? Uh, so this is mathematical way of doing. Of course, I can do it a bit. Uh, oh, well, in this approach, don't. I don't have to. Because transition function should be defined only on the intersections. So the only thing I have to guarantee that I have a patching and uh, my intersection do not have fixed point. That's it. So in this mathematical way, I don't have to worry anything. I, I will answer your next question in a moment. So I will do, this is what mathematicians will do, now I will do what physicists will do. But in this way, there is no problem because I just have to make sure that they intersect and everything works. So of course, for physicists, what is important, right? So when we discuss self-duality, we have self-projectors, self-dual forms, anti-self-dual forms. Uh, so we would like to actually write a projector. Now, if you stare at this, so, okay, there are two problems here. Uh, so if M is not well defined at fixed point, that's the only problem I have. Uh, but otherwise what I can do, I can for you construct actually uh, a new operation, right? So if I would write, You want to go really math? I mean, I'm, I'm I, of course, but you know, it's not, I mean, whatever example you take, you would believe that one can show it, I mean, right? It doesn't look like. I mean, if you challenge me, I don't want to go to math. I'm, I'm going next week to math conference, then I will give a math talk, but I'm not, I mean, you're absolutely correct, but you know, this is not a level of discussion at physics conference, okay? But let me, make, let me make you more relaxed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But let me make you more relaxed, so because I can do things totally different way. So what I can do, I can do as what physicists do, because you will be totally satisfied if I give you a projector, which is every way defined, well defined, right? So basically, if you look at these operations, you can construct a new operation, plus beta m, which squares to one, provided that alpha square plus beta square is equal to one, okay? So in principle, what you can do, well, this condition is very easy to solve, it's just cosine of some angle, etc. So basically I can construct, I mean, just historically we call it like this, uh, this guy plus cosine of uh, rho star plus sine rho of m. So now the question is that rho is some function. Now what I have to guarantee that these things is well defined, is well defined. Well, in fact, what I have to guarantee that rho goes to zero at fixed points in certain particular ways. So rho goes to zero at fixed points. So you see when rho goes to zero, this disappeared fixed point, so I get exactly at fixed point. My cosine, if this is zero, cosine can be either plus or minus one. So this just becomes self-duality exactly at fixed points. So these functions exist, moreover, on torus, to, with T2 action, you can always choose them invariant, et cetera. Uh, I mean, it's, it's no problem because it's a very, very weak condition. I mean. In, in fact, there is things when you construct the sign of rho even from V. But the whole thing is that you have one over V norm, so you, this should behave exactly in the same way, at least. And this is no problem with this. So you actually can write this projector and, you know, again, at first, um, so this projector we actually derived not the way I'm telling you. I mean, this is, sounds nice, but this is what comes from Balini of, of killing spinners, actually. 
And this projector you can, I mean, Piaston didn't write, but you can definitely write very nicely in local corner, et cetera, et cetera, and this row would correspond to one of the angles, et cetera, okay? Um, so this guy, in fact, is a projector which you can write down. So for example, if you want to adapt it more to supersymmetry, there is another redefinition of angle So there is, um, you can define this projector in a different way. One plus cosine omega star minus sine square. You will see in a moment why I like this form. So this form actually dictated from supersymmetry, where omega is some function, and again, I have to assume that omega goes to zero at fixed points. So this is actually a projector and gives you orthogonal decomposition of two forms. Okay. It gives you orthogonal decomposition of two forms. Uh, so why do we like this projector? So if you actually write this bound, so right, we, we, we like to write bounds with these projectors and typically when we write square of cell dual forms, it's equal to Young-Mills plus dual uh, term. So now if you do this exercise here, P omega plus of uh, F uh, which P omega plus star of F. So then the formula will be the following. So whoever remembers very well Peston will now recognize what it is. And then there is this term. I mean, this term you should not worry very much because it will be canceled by another burst exact terms. So now what you can see is the following thing. So you have a, so, I mean, if you look at some point in Peston, it's exactly this formula, I mean, you have. So you have, at some point, it will be instantons, at some point it will be anti-instantons, okay? And again, if you write this in supersymmetric theory, so in a way, the Peston theory is the following. You take uh, donaldson newton theory equivalent, and instead of self-duality, you just replaced everything by this bundle. And that's a Peston theory. And that's how it will work. And exactly, you will have a jumps of instant on and anti-instant ons. Okay? So I don't have much time, and I could have told you much, much more. Uh, let me just maybe make some comments. Um, so there is, for example, gluing procedure, etc. So in fact, it's very, it's very good to also uh, try to derive, uh, so this is how we attack the problem of killing spinner supersymmetric theory. So actually what we did is that we assumed that like locally at one patch, we have a topological twisting. So then actually we had to define that we have to rotate our spinners, maybe multiply by some factors, and then they have to satisfy, have to be globally defined, okay? And also they have to have a fixed bilinear because if you have a bilinear, of course, typically you will have a vector field corresponding to bilinear, right? Of your two killing spinners. Uh, and in fact, one can do the things. So you have a f uh, spinners, you fix them. So again, the idea that, you, I mean, they look as um, uh, you take a topological twist. So basically you identify SU2 Lorentz, SU2 uh, our symmetry, so in some basis you basically choose them like a Kronecker symbol when you multiply by some factors and then you will rotate by SU2 symmetry and then you have to guarantee that you can glue it consistently over patches. That can be done. So then you just guarantee that they're bilinear correct. So for example, bilinear when you squashed uh, them for, uh, between two sigmas, you will get some object which exactly will uh, you know, be, behave very nicely with respect to this projector. And then, you know, you try to put this in supergravity and then you calculate, you try to fix the grounds, et cetera. And at the end of the day, everything works. So you're not trying to approach problem the way we typically address. And again, 
I think at this time it's very useful because the ground fields exist, everything works, they just look very ugly, but you can sort of derive them, everything and fixed. So this is one comment, and I think this is a nice idea, the way we derived killing spinners and actually fix supersymmetry. So I'm not actually talking about this very much. Um, what else? Uh, again, I'm uh, actually skipping a lot of technical things because um, uh, I'm not discussing for you different vanishing theorems, how to localize, I'm not discussing fluxes, I'm not uh, discussing how to write one loop. So for example, uh, we can calculate using index theorem one loop. Uh, I mean, every fixed point will contribute to one loop. Uh, unless we have a proper toric symmetry, we cannot write it as a single function, etc. cetera, because, uh, so, just be aware that when we say toric symmetry, toric manifold, we actually don't mean that we have just T2 action. We, we have much more. We have, for example, typically symplectic form. Uh, I mean, all these diagrams we are drawing, convex diagrams, I mean, they typically assume symplectic structure. So this setup is much more general. So, for example, if we will go to Keller manifold, we can write things, I mean, in very nice form. Generally not, because there are situations when you're, I mean, with a torus section when your basically cone is not convex. I mean, so when you will have things like this, et cetera. I mean, this is possible outside of simple case. So we, in principle, we cover over since this, but it gives us much less uh, tools, et cetera, because there is no cone defined, et cetera. So although locally we can calculate the answer, but we are having a problem to write, uh, you know, as a closed result, et cetera. So I didn't discuss it. And of course, I didn't discuss how to calculate determinants, et cetera. It's all this beautiful work of transversely, I mean, um, transversely elliptic operators, et cetera. So, and in a way, everything works, everything beautifully nice, et cetera. So I basically, my intention was just to give you a rough idea. So I should stop. Thank you very much.